So tell me some things you think I should know about subatomic particles. So I think the textbook covers it, but just as a quick recap, we have protons, neutrons, and electrons all in an atom. And that's why, yep, neutrons and electrons. That's where the name subatomic comes from because they make up a part of an atom. Okay. And we know some things about them. We know that electrons have a negative charge. And we know protons have a positive charge. And we know neutrons are neutral. I don't know, I'll put it in there for that. Fair enough. Yep. Um, we know some things about where they're located. We know that electrons are uh, outside of the nucleus. We know that protons and neutrons are in the nucleus of an atom. Um, what else should we, do you think we should know? Um, I'd probably say that's really the basics of the subatomic particles that you need to know for this course. Uh, but I think the main driving question I'd, I I kind of wanted to discuss today is um, how how did we figure out or why is this important? Like how did we figure out that the protons and the neutrons are all bundled up together in the in the center, and that the electrons are whizzing around it? And not so much the process, because that involves a lot of tedious physics. Uh, there's a lot of radiation, ra radiation, radioactive chemistry involved with that, but just kind of the thought process, because if you think about it, it's really just an insane concept that Someone said that all matter is made up of these small things that we can't even see, right? Apparently. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know enough mathematics to know whether any of that stuff is right or not, right? I just don't know it. So I take a lot of it on faith. The only thing that works for me is I am willing to believe, I do actually believe in electricity. And somebody got the idea, and somebody got the idea that electricity is a flow of electrons. Somehow, right? And yeah. so if we believe that electricity does something useful for us, which seems to, I mean, um, yeah. and we decide that there are these things that are going from one place to another, place A to place B, and we decide to call them these little negative charges. And as that happens, whatever they're flowing through doesn't get like totally destroyed or to somehow manages to exist. I kind of feel like whatever this A is made out of, which often for us is copper atoms, but often metal atoms. And if we half believe the photoelectric effect, which is to say, hey, you can shine light on something and get these electrons to leave it, <laughs> then that makes me a little bit convinced that electrons actually exist. It certainly, certainly explains a lot, right? And I think in science and in chemistry, we're interested in trying to come up with explanations that are consistent with the way we see the universe operate. And 
it seems to me pretty convincing that electricity seems to work, that solar electricity seems to work, that you seem to be able to shine light on this substance and electrons flow out of it. So that seems plausible to me. So I, I have to believe in electrons. I feel like, yeah, there's, in terms of a consistent idea, it seems to make sense for me. So I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah, that's a really good example. Um, that was one of my examples, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then... Keep going. Another example, a little bit, a lot more on the scarier side. And chemists and scientists, historians have a huge discussion about this, is with the atom bomb, you know? And so this is going into radioactive chemistry. Um, I won't explain it too much, but if you've studied U.S. history or world history at all, you know that in World War II, the U.S. dropped two atom bombs on Japan, and the destruction that it sowed is immeasurable. And you can't make up, well, I don't think you should make up any of this, but if you don't believe that atoms don't exist, and then you see on the news or you witness an atom bomb being dropped, I think that atoms exist and that the protons and the neutrons had to interact in some sort of way to create such destructive power. Does that make sense? I hadn't thought about it this way. But there's a huge amount of energy involved there somehow, right? And some sort of conversions and um, the yeah, there, it's, a, it's an unbelievable amount of energy given the size of the bomb that produced it, right? It's really outside of our typical scale. Fortunately, it's outside of our typical scale of thinking about things like that. Yeah, um, I was going to use radioactivity uh, as, a, an, as potential evidence for subatomic particles in a slightly different way. Okay, hopefully it's a bit more on the brighter side. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's on the brighter side or not. But um, when a certain bombs or certain nuclear reactions take place, one of the products of them is a neutron. And um, a neutron with its zero charge and its mass of one, right, uh, is one of the products. So we've got something over here that reacts and it produces a neutron. In fact, actually, most radioactive nuclear power plants will produce three neutrons. And the way they produce it is they find, they get one neutron, one of the react, one of the, on this reactant side of this arrow is a neutron that gets accelerated and it collides with some other atoms. And when that happens, this atom here splits into two, some other products and three neutrons. And those neutrons are then available to hit whatever this compound was. And so it goes from one neutron hitting, splitting, and producing three neutrons. And so there's uh, um, radioactive, there's material here and that splits into, into two other products and three neutrons. And then these three neutrons are available to hit more of this material. And they can produce 
three more neutrons. And so on. And so this first neutron produces three, produces nine, I guess produces 27. And every step along the way, you're getting a huge amount of energy. Have you seen that before? Uh, yeah. When I think that's covered in Chem 141, the next course, I exactly, believe. Exactly, yeah. 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 And in fact, for nuclear power plants, they do something similar to this, but they have to, in order for it, and rather than to be this kind of explosive reaction from one amount of energy to three amounts to nine amounts to 27 to whatever 27 cubed is to whatever that number is, cubed amounts of energy, they somehow have to capture these two neutrons, capture these two neutrons. Yeah, so if it captures these two, then you only have one. These ones don't even exist capture those two, and so then you have a much more controlled reaction, and that's how nuclear power plants are, um, operate. But one of my, we started on this conversation because I was interested in one of the reactions I know that produces a neutron. Another, so another way of producing a neutron is if you have a proton, that combines with an electron. And so you can have subatomic particles, and I think that in this case, the, an electron would be captured by a proton in the nucleus to produce a neutron. And so in this reaction, which I think is called beta capture, inside the nucleus, down in the center, somehow, a proton that's down in there captures either one of these electrons or some other electron that comes in, and it goes from being a being a positive having a, well, it loses one of the positive charges that it would have normally had, and so that gets to produce a neutron down there in the center. So. One of the things that I take from this is that if you can have a, 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 an electron and a proton form a neutron, that says to me that a neutron is not one of the fundamental subatomic particles. Right, so we started off by saying uh, proton, electron, and neutron. But if these two things can turn into one of these, then there must be something about all of these that is more fundamental than they are themselves, right? If a proton can become, can become a neutron, at the very least, according to this reaction, a, a neutron is some sort of combination of protons and electrons. And I think, and this is, the, this is the only way that I have of understanding, is that this is where quarks are involved. Oh, quarks. Right, and so that there are apparently six particles, six quarks, six different types of quarks. And so some combination of those make up protons, electrons, and neutrons. And when the, when the quarks in a proton and electron combine, they reconfigure into the quarks that make up a neutron. Mm -hmm. But that's the, that's the only way that I have of understanding anything about quarks. If you want to know more about quarks, you got to put your head in physics and go like crazy. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I think this was a good discussion, you know. Uh, we kind of didn't really know where we, where we were heading with this, but I think some kind of logical conclusion, some logical thinking. You don't have to be a talented chemist to understand everything. You just, sometimes you can use real world examples. You can use electricity, nuclear energy to, to at least accept that there are subatomic particles, right? That, sure. 
exactly what you're writing. You don't have to be a talented chemist to understand all about atoms. Use parts of chemistry, comma, <laughs> real life, physics, logic, What we observe, yeah. What else? Mm -hmm. Got anything else? Um, I think that wraps it up pretty nicely. Just those two major points. Um, and we just did this with atoms. You could maybe apply this to heat, to temperature and that stuff, or any other topics really in this course. So yeah. maybe this in the end isn't solely about subatomic particles, but that's the main point we're kind of driving here. Yeah, to... it's, about, yeah. it's about making sense of whatever the topic is using the knowledge that you've got and trying to uh, understand it as, as best you can. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in this course, we care about protons, electrons, and neutrons, and not much else. Um, yeah. <laughs>